Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast, the Achilles Systems Hack Assessment Series Part 2, Revisiting Enterprise Controls. Today's featured speaker is Brian Ventura, SANS Certified Instructor and author of the SANS Sec 566 Implementing and Auditing CIS Controls course. If during the webcast you have any questions for Brian, please enter them into the Q&A window at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing in the next 24 hours and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Brian. Thank you, Lauren. Welcome, everybody. I hope we're having a good day. Happy Wednesday. Um, it's morning for me because I'm on the West Coast, but it's afternoon if you're on the East Coast. And I imagine it's in the evening if you're in Europe or even other places where it's even later. So, so welcome everybody. Uh, this is our second part in a series of us talking about the Achilles system hack. And Achilles, of course, is a fictitious company that we've created, but we created a, an attack simulation or a uh, the idea of a real breach happening happening to this organization, the components of this breach are real world. These really could happen. So we're talking about it and hoping that we can learn from uh, what we have coming out of this fictitious breach, uh, but let's pretend like it's real so we can learn from that. Now, this is a part of our operational uh, cybersecurity triad. And the concept here is we recognize that to do certain tasks to uh, ensure that you're securing your organization at a certain level, there are a few of our course material or courses that really focus on those things. So specifically for operational security, making sure that we're doing the right things at the right moment, blocking the adversary, detecting the adversary, and ultimately responding to anything that we find, we see that these three courses fit together really well. We started out uh, la last month with uh, security operations, and Mark Orlando talked about um, how to uh, utilize this Achilles breach to recognize where gaps are and how to build up a security operations center that could detect this earlier and clean up the incident before it becomes a breach. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some of the controls and the gaps that were found inside of this, which again, this is common for organizations to fall into some of these traps, to have some of these weaknesses. So that's why we want to talk about them and how to overcome them. And then next month, we're, whoops, I clicked. Uh, next month, we're going to talk about vulnerability specifically. So we have a third uh, uh, webinar that we're going to talk about um, our uh, vulnerability management, how that relates to this, how we can find those, maybe instead of using the word vulnerability, I'll use a bigger word, weakness, because a vulnerability might be, we might be thinking CVE, that known vulnerability, but there's also the unknown vulnerabilities and there's also the idea of a secure configuration vulnerability, or well, I better call that a weakness. So my system might be weak just because I didn't turn on the security control that I thought that I, that, or that I assumed was there. So that's vulnerability management. That'll be next month. We will wrap this up with a, um, a live event where we'll actually practice using our Cyber42 um, simulation and see if we can walk through some of these um, scenarios. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. And uh, I've been with in the cybersecurity world for at least a decade, although my, my IT goes back to the 90s. And what, back in the 90s, there really wasn't um, information security as a title. So I did a lot of my work under the systems administrator hat and still did security, did secure configurations, built firewalls, thought about segmentation, did a lot of those components but from a systems administrator lens. And then in 2014, I shifted over to information security. I started working with SANS and I rounded out some of those areas that I was not aware of as a systems administrator uh, doing security, the other components of security. So I've, I've expanded myself there. I have a lot of experience all over the world, small business, large business, uh, Fortune 50 companies, but also government and private sector or government and public sector as well. So uh, I, I have a pretty wide range of experience. Hopefully that applies pretty well as, as I'm teaching the courses and then doing my consulting practice on the side. I do a lot of GRC stuff at this point. 
All right. Now, what are we going over today? Well, I'm going to go over a few slides that set the stage. Now, Mark already talked about those last month, but that was a whole month ago. And so I'm just going to go over them briefly so that we understand what happened. What was the breach? What was the concern? How did it occur? Then we'll talk about how the controls specifically and building out uh, our programs and ensuring we have policy and all of those things, how those are going to fit in and ensure that we can at least detect these things, but ideally prevent them before they become a serious issue. We'll have to talk about some of these other components like governance. The CIS controls don't like to talk about governance, but it's an important concept. We need to have those policies. We need to have that structure. We need to have authority to, to make decisions around security. So uh, we'll talk about some of that and, and engaging the management and leadership of the, of the rest of the organization and the business units on how we do that work. And then our last section, I want really want to focus on measurement and assessment. The uh, Anything that we do in security, we should be able to measure how well we're doing. Um, we should be able to measure lots of different components of that. So let's talk about measurement for each of the things that we do as we build out our controls. So some background, thinking about this specific breach, Achilles Systems, a fictitious company again, but they provide services to their customers and they're specifically HR type solutions and they provide a software as a service platform. They also do remote work, helping those HR teams do the work. So they will log into those systems for uh, on behalf of the client and do some of that work. So they might have access into client networks. Generally, thinking about what, what their organization, their ecosystem, their security ecosystem really looked like, we can see that they were focused on the CIS controls. I see a lot of companies adopting that. It's easy to get into. Um, it's a great starting point. I, I highly recommend the CIS controls, but they're still working on them. And unfortunately, that's the other side of what I see when I talk to a lot of customers. So yeah, we chose the CIS controls and we're doing all right. We're, 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 we're making our progress. In other words, we might have stalled out. It's been three, four, five years, and we're still on the beginning parts. So there's always that possibility. So, um, so that th this is common, unfortunately. We don't want to see this, but it is a place that many organizations end up in. Uh, they've got basic tools. They've got log monitoring, things like that. They even have rolled out multi-factor authentication because today you got to do that, right? This is important. And then last, they've also rolled out an endpoint detection and response, an EDR solution. So that's a more advanced solution that's supposed to identify these types of attacks, these incidents, before they become breaches. So that should have saved us, right? And then generally, security is part of IT. Do you find this to be true? It's, it's the most common way that we have it right now, though it's, it's shrinking. There's actually more movement of IT doesn't belong, or sorry, information security doesn't belong only in IT because we have a conflict of interest. Should we build the new um, features for the business unit or should we secure the old features? Often the new features take precedent because that's going to drive business, that's going to make us money. Securing things, that's, the, that's an after effect and that doesn't make us money and uh, just saves us. But... We haven't had a problem in the past, so why do we need that security? Not a good argument, Brian. I understand, but that's where people are, our organization sometimes are. So ad hoc, IT was doing some of the work for them. Best effort, obviously in this situation, not enough. And then also those security audits were high level. Um, for instance, the auditor might've come in. Do you have a, you're supposed to have a firewall. Do you have a firewall? And your answer is why, yes, we have a firewall. They say, okay, great, and they move on. You're like, but wait a minute, you didn't ask me if I'm using the firewall. The firewall's in a, in a box right there. I'm, there's a box right behind me. There's, there's where my firewall is. It's not plugged in. But I, I passed the uh, assessment because the assessment said I had to have a firewall. Now, that's a very simple example, but that's the idea. So, you know, they're doing best effort. They're not extremely mature. Security is not a focus of the organization. Uh, and they got hit. And, they, and, and fortunately, it failed for them. So we've got to do something about that. Now the specifics of the breach, lots of details here. I'm gonna I'm gonna high level it, just give you the, the highlights of this, but you're welcome to read through this. The what happened was they had their systems, they were running, and the help desk gets a phone call. 
and help desk phone call. Hey, I'm an executive with the organization. Can't get into my system. Can you reset my multi-factor? This help desk person um, resets that multi-factor. That executive is happy. Oh, wait, that wasn't the real executive. That was the attacker pretending to be the executive and bypassing our, our controls in some way, getting their own version of multi-factor authentication. Now they can log into everything. They leveraged that to break into the organization. They moved around laterally in the network. They disabled that endpoint uh, detection and response solution. They um, got onto the systems that had the sensitive data. They installed software on those systems and exfiltrated data. We didn't figure it out until that software was found and people were like, wait a minute, I never installed that software and I'm the administrator. Why would that software be on there? And that was the red flag. However, they don't have the, the logs that they need to determine how bad this was and how often did the, the adversary break in and what did they do while they were in there? They don't have that information. Now, we're here, this conversation, pretending Brian, Mark, uh, we've, been come in, we've come in to help Achilles to build a better program to resolve some of these issues. The incident response, that's being handled by somebody else. We don't have to worry too much about incident response. It's a bad day, but they're cleaning it up. But we wanna see from this, what are our lessons learned? What can we do to enhance this? And like I said, Mark last week talked about what we could do to build a security operations center, build out that detection side of things, and ultimately response as well. But really focusing on that detection, can I find the adversary before they do damage? So that's an idea. Now, some contributing factors uh, just to understand. So I talked a little bit about this stuff, but customer base has grown very quickly. So they, they decided to do CIS controls. They started doing some stuff. In that same period, the business went crazy. They sold more things. They, they had to move to 24 seven, et cetera. And what they found was their security team, their IT teams have not grown at the same level. They haven't gotten to that same level of experience or expectation to be able to identify the adversary. Their de detection and response, that was ad hoc. They had that EDR, but they really didn't have the person sitting there watching the system. And unfortunately, an endpoint detection is the idea that it's just looking at the system and telling you when bad things are happening. Hey, I saw an adversary on the system. Hey, I saw another one. Hey, they stole some stuff. But if you're not looking at that alert, if you don't have that alert configured, you don't get that information. You don't get to utilize it. And so they, they had some failures there. Um, and then their controls themselves, some of them failed. Some of them were turned off. They didn't even notice that they were turned off. We should notice when our, when our controls are turned off, right? When they fail, when something breaks. So those are some of those things. And then ultimately I'll get into how do we connect to some of the other requirements we may have. So do we have frameworks? Do we have plans? Do we have robust policy? Are people actually following the policy? Just because you wrote it doesn't mean that it's in, per in place. Uh, just because you, you've signed off on it, if no one has read it, no one knows that it's there and it's not being followed. So where can we go? Now that we understand what's going on, we can see that um, they've invested with security, but they invested in a way that was more thinking about, there's a list of good things to do. Here are the list of good things. I'm gonna check the boxes. I am supposed to have control one of the CIS controls, which happens to say, have an inventory of all your devices, all your enterprise assets, and I created an inventory. Okay, did you put everything in the inventory? Well, maybe not. I might, I might have missed some of that. You know, so they didn't have everything built out. Um, they were just thinking about coming up with the, or checking the boxes on the list. However, attackers don't think that way. They think in more of this graph theory. It's a kind of a, a newer concept that we're thinking about. They're thinking about any way they can come into your organization. They're not thinking about, oh, you have a firewall. Well, then I shouldn't try. Oh, you have a multi-factor. Well, then obviously I can't get by. They say, well, how do I get around your firewall? Well, that's to fish your users. Well, how do I get around your multi-factor authentication? Maybe in this case, it's call your help desk. Tell them you're the most important person and you need a, a response now and fix my stuff. So there were some gaps. There were some issues. They weren't thinking like an adversary. They weren't putting all the things in place. Um, 
Uh, yes. So there's a quick question. Uh, thank you, Randall, for, for asking that. I have said CIS many times, CIS controls, but I didn't define what the heck that was. So that would be the Center for Internet Security uh, set of controls, and they, they are known as the Center for Internet Security Critical Security Controls, which shortens down to CIS controls. Uh, but you may have heard of them as the Critical Security Controls or the SANS Top 20. Uh, the new name is the CIS Controls, and the Center for Internet Security is the home for those. So thank you for that question. All right. Uh, now, what can we learn from all of this and how can we improve it? So let's find those, those areas where we can succeed. Okay. Now, some things to think about. One, one of the areas that I find is a big gap, and this is outside of your control frameworks. This is thinking about um, why security fails. And one of the things that I will find I find is that security is ultimately not aligned with the business. Security is part of IT, and they've been tasked through the IT department to go ahead and take care of that information security thing. And they said, well, what should I do? And they might have said, hey, we've got some compliance programs. I'm now responsible for those, or at least a part uh, contributing factor. And so I'll make sure we pass PCI. And then I'll find out that, oh, we got to follow this regulation and we've got to follow this framework. So we'll I'll, I'll build those things. But I'm not aligning with the business. I'm just doing my security work in my security chair, in my security office. I'm not thinking about the business. And that's going to be a, a problem because the controls that we put in place, what is the purpose of putting controls in place? What's the purpose of the firewall? What's the purpose of endpoint detection and response? Well, obviously protect the organization, but what are you really protecting when I say the organization? Well, ultimately it's those business lines. The act of making money or completing the mission or delivering on requirements, whatever that organization is required to do, that's what they're really trying to do. Security is just making sure that the guide rails are in there, that they're, they aren't gonna uh, have a significant problem due to a security focused problem. There's plenty of other issues that could happen. We're only focused about security, but we need to align it with that business. So we'll talk about some of that stuff. Uh, also thinking about what issues did they have specifically? Can we figure out what control should be put in that place? What we can put in place uh, for to fill those gaps? All right. So. I mentioned the CIS controls, again, the Center for Internet Security and the Center for Internet Security's critical security controls. Uh, these were built a number of years ago. They actually come out of the US federal government originally, uh, but were brought into the public sector by SANS when we found out about them. Uh, there were some, some key players in the federal government space. Uh, we've got... Um, Tony Sager, John Gilligan, Jane Lute, these are all people that have been in uh, either NSA or Air Force or um, CISA, respectively, actually. Uh, they were all a part of this process of trying to secure the federal government space, and they were having difficulties. And specifically, Tony Sager was uh, assessing the Air Force, in this case, John Gilligan as the CIO, and they got to, into a conversation and realized that these assessments were not doing any good in the end because they were demoralizing to the actual security experts that are protecting the network, these uh, uh, penetration testers, red teamers would walk all over their network and break in and that wouldn't help them out. And they'd try to fix it because they'd say, hey, uh, I broke in because you have a heart bleed problem or a log for shell problem or a whatever that big vulnerability is. And they would patch that vulnerability. But then the next year there's another vulnerability. So uh, Tony Sager, John Gilligan got together and created a cheat sheet on how to protect the organization. That got uh, pushed around the rest of the federal government and lots of organizations were doing it. SANS found out about it and uh, asked for a copy of it and we published it. So there's no proprietary, you know, top secret governmental information in it. It's just good ideas like, hey, have a firewall and have, have an intrusion detection system, right? So this list became the SANS Top 20, which then became the critical security controls. But then SANS didn't want to own it because some companies were saying, we don't want a private entity solution. So we handed it off for the center to the Center for Internet Security as a nonprofit to promote that. So that's where it's coming from. There's a few different ways that we can implement that. Um, I'll talk about the implementation groups in a moment. 
And then also we wanna make sure that whatever we're doing, CIS controls, more detection, security operations center, whatever this is, we need to align that back to the business and really get those business leaders engaged in information security. Otherwise, we, we're not gonna get anything done or we're not gonna be successful with what we have. And to give you a quick flavor of why I really care about the business, we could have two businesses that are doing the same work and they will have a different leadership, they will have a different uh, approach and therefore their security would be different. And my big example for that is if you think about uh, your, your the system to get from one place to another and I don't have a vehicle, so I'm gonna call somebody and have them take me there. So ride um, shares. And uh, previously I would call a cab. A long time ago, I would call a cab company. They would drive out. I would get in the cab. I would give the person money. They would drive me to the place that I want to be and, and I'd be good to go. Well, those companies, lots of regulation, very heavy handed with the regulation. They've, it's, they've been in the industry for a very long time. They are not, they don't like risk very adverse to risk. So they are very set in their ways. They follow the rules. They do the bare minimum and they have a successful business. But along comes this incumbent over the past decade. We've got these Uber and Lyfts. They're still doing the same thing. I call them up. They send a car out. I give them money. They take me to the place that I want to go. But they shifted it. Instead of making a phone call, I use an app. Instead of talking to a person, I just play with my phone. It gives me this uh, real-time view of it, all this fun stuff. However, the big thing that I wanna talk about, the difference in this, they're both doing the same work, but one is very risk averse, the cab company. One is very accepting of risk, the Ubers, the Lyfts, because they're brand new companies and they flouted actually the regulation. So they have a way different view. If I'm a security person at a cab company and, I, and then I move over to Uber or Lyft, I'm going to do it fundamentally differently. They're going to accept more risk in Uber and Lyft than they're going to um, do in those cab companies. I need to understand this. So these are the reasons why we need to engage with the business. There's not one size fits all for these uh, security controls. So the CIS controls I've talked about in a little bit, they're foundational, they're technical in nature. They, and ultimately we've been, they've been found to protect 85% and more of real attacks that have occurred on the network. So that's pretty awesome. Um, we have these guiding principles. These are our original guiding principles. Hey, we should have the most, uh, focus on the most common attacks, find the controls for that, throw out the controls that are not happening very commonly and that aren't very damaging. They're important, but not this important. We want consistency across all our systems. We want to make sure everything has these controls so that there's no gaps where they come in, they wiggle in through the back door. We want to use automation because we can do good work, but ultimately we have to go home and sleep apparently. At least some of my employees do. It's really annoying. But seriously, you know, we're not going to be there all the time. So let's automate, get, get consistency. Um, let's make sure there are technical controls. Let's get rid of the governance things. Oh, but wait, we got to think about the governance things in this Achilles um, attack. So, well, I'll have to bring that up, but it's not part of the CIS controls. And then ultimately, I want to measure everything we're doing. So if I tell you to do something, I want you to measure it. See how well you're doing. So let's see how this plays out. So some of these other things, though, before I jump into actually the, the, the attack and how we can re respond to it, um, we need to also think about other governance related things. So we talked about the technical with CIS, now let's talk about the governance. Do we have other requirements that we, we need to meet? Do we have regulatory requirements, other frameworks that we're supposed to meet? Are we doing some kind of um, assessments like a SOC 2 type 2, or we've got to get our PC, PCI attestation of compliance, our AOC, if you've heard it that way, right? What are the things that we're required to do? Um, they're, they have specific things. They are providing software as a service. Their customers probably have requirements for you must meet these things. The SOC 2 Type 2 as an example, but they might have specifics. Find those areas where you need to do additional controls, additional work um, to make sure we're meeting those controls as well. We also need some help with security. You can't just have a bunch of technical people. Not, you can't just have a bunch of IT and information security people. You need the business engaged. You need HR engaged. You need legal teams engaged. 
We need to work on that. Let's work on making sure that we understand who's helping us with security, who's having this conversation, how do we roll this up? And you might answer, well, we don't do that in my organization. We don't have a steering committee. That's the gap I'm talking about. You know, if you say that you don't have a steering committee that you meet with quarterly, monthly, at least annually, that's a gap in your organization that's going to cause something like this Achilles breach because you're not aligning your controls into your business because your business doesn't, isn't telling you what it needs. You know, we have to have that conversation and the steering committee is an excellent way to do it. So high level. Okay. So getting more specific though, we need to identify gaps. And I'm going to go into more detail with these, but there are specific de controls that were attached touched, bleh, uh, affected, and had gaps in this incident. We also found in this incident specific things that are outside of necessarily a technical control that probably also need to be reviewed. So the, some of the process is specific, because again, I'm going to go into the controls. Uh, the help desk had an account recovery process, which included call the help desk and will reset your authenticator. That sounds great. But how did you um, prove that the person that was calling was the actual person that you're supposed to be changing that for? There was a gap there. There was an issue. Let's uh, address that. Let's figure out better ways to identify someone who's calling and maybe even have certain people like this executive that can't call the help desk. They got to physically talk to somebody because their account is that important. We got to figure out those controls. We got to figure out that governance. Um, are there con pro uh, controls that were that failed and we didn't know about it? Well, where is our monitoring around that? Um, we need to monitor our network. We need to have visibility of some of those cloud assets and things like that. So some of the areas that we should address. So high level again, what are we doing? Well, we should have a plan for how we're going to get better, how we're going to leverage this unfortunate incident, this breach, to get better with our security and get a closer alignment with the business. So that business alignment, well, how do, what do they want to see? Well, they want to, they want to see how well we're doing to meet their business goals. So maybe dashboards, service level agreements with the business. We will recover things in this much time. We will do the, we will do these things. Something I want to get from that business leadership. What is your risk appetite? What do you want to accept? You know, is is a little bit of risk okay? Is a lot of bit of a lot of risk okay? We need to understand that because that's how we're building our controls. And then ultimately, we probably have to go back to the leadership and say we need more people. This is a problem globally. This is a problem in our industry, but it's also a problem in how we look at cybersecurity. We look at cybersecurity and we say I want to buy a preventative control because it's cheap. $100,000, a million dollars for that control, that's cheap compared to a detective control that's $100,000, a million dollars, and I've got to pay a staff person to watch it all the time. That's far more expensive. So we need to talk to our businesses and say, hey, do we need more staff so that we can have a better security operations center, so that we can have better controls, so that we can have better measurement, et cetera? What other controls do we need? What uh, where can we find those? What measurements can we put out there? Are there those other additional process gaps that we can look at? All right, so let's dig into the CIS controls uh, a little bit, and then I'll actually talk about our, um, our incident. So the CIS controls, 18 controls today, and each of these controls have a number of what we call safeguards. And so for instance, control number one has five total safeguards. And we can see that um, if we add all those up, we're getting like 153 safeguards. So in other words, the CIS controls, while they have 18 families, there are 153 good things we tell you to do. So. Those are the CIS controls. Again, I told you where they came from. Uh, we've, been, we've been maintaining these for more than a decade, probably two decades at this point. So they've been around a while. One of the things that uh, came up while building and maintaining the controls is how do I implement these? I'm a small organization. I'm a medium organization. I'm a, I'm a large organization. What should I do? And so we came up with these implementation groups. They also work as a prioritization or a method for implementing the controls. So I can go through implementation group one, even though I'm an enterprise, I do implementation group one first, 
that gets me some of the controls. I then do implementation group two, that gives me more of the controls. And then I finish out with implementation group three, finishing all of the controls and safeguards. So it's a way to flow through this. Um, small organizations will only do implementation group one. This is under 100 people. Implementation group two, maybe under 1,000 people in your organization, you're only going to get through group one and group two. And by the way, group two does include group one. And then for those enterprises, 5,000 and more, you're going to do everything, but you're probably going to do implementation group one first, then two, then finish it out with three. That also gets me to have a conversation about if there's 153 things I'm asking you to do, how long is it going to take you to do them? And you might find that this is a three to five year process. That's what we recommend. Um, now, if you're greenfielding, you're building it all new, you could get it done in a year. But who's doing that? I have existing systems. I have existing customers. I have existing um, services that I expect to stay the way that they are or up and running, especially. So that makes it a little bit harder. That's for the three to five years. I was in the government space five to seven years to get through this. Breaking them down, um, if you're doing implementation group one, you're getting 56 good things done. Implementation group two adds 74 more. So you can see that we're more than two thirds of the way through once we finish these two implementation groups. Implementation group three puts the icing on the cake of 23 more safeguards to finish it out. Now, while doing this proj project, while doing the CIS controls, Center for Net Security said, well, we've got those guiding principles. I wonder if these controls actually do anything. You know, do they do they block the adversary? So what they did is they took those community-based consensus rules, those guiding principles I mentioned. They then leveraged some technologies that didn't exist back in the day, like MITRE ATT&CK and things like this, to be able to determine what the adversary is doing so that they could then map that into the controls and determine what are the controls doing for us. So they did this two ways. Here's what the controls are doing. What are we actually blocking as an that the adversary would be doing? That's interesting. But they did it another way. Hey, MITRE ATT&CK says these are the most common ways that adversaries break in. These are the most common things that, are, that they're doing. And then map that back to the CIS controls. Do they address that? And what they found in that research, if you're just doing implementation group one, the bare minimum, the starting point, you're getting about 75% or more protection from certain types of attacks. Specifically, the top five most common things, malware, ransomware, web app hack hacking, privilege misuse, and targeted intrusions. If you implement all of the controls, you finish implementation group three, you're above 90%. That's pretty awesome. Now, does that the could there be somebody in the last ten percent that's a very sophisticated attacker? Absolutely. But the CIS controls are a starting point. They're not a finishing line. They're not the comprehensive list of all controls you should do. They are the bare minimum, what I call the low water mark. So the low water mark could block us by to ninety percent if we implement everything. Now, Achilles didn't do that. Achilles had troubles. So let's look at this attack flow. The attack flow, hey, the adversary broke in, or sorry, called the help desk and said, I am this executive, lied to them, and was able to get the MFA policy or get the multi-factor authentication token. So there's obviously problems in the procedure. There's problems with phone authentication of some sort that we need to do. Single, or sorry, self-service can be an option for this. We can have those conversations. But specifically, the CIS controls number five and number six focus on these areas and coming up with solutions there. So we had failures in control five and control six regarding how you give credentials out and how you change credentials and how you monitor those credentials and how you identify when they're being misused. So that's where we're gonna see some of this. But we continue that attack. They disabled some controls. So first off, the audit logging solution is where the endpoint detection and response really fits. So there was a failure in endpoint detection and response specifically, but there was also a general failure of all 18 of these controls, all 153 safeguards. There should have been a measurement there and there should have been a monitor there. And when that EDR got turned off within minutes to hours, we should have been told, hey, you're an endpoint intrusion, intrusion and that. your endpoint detection and response solution is no longer functioning. We're not getting telemetry from it. We have, a, we have a log entry that says this has been turned off. 
by Brian Ventura or whoever did it. So we know when it happened. So we're not monitoring that. We don't have measurement of how well our controls are doing. So there are some issues. Continuing on, they talk, talked about lateral movement. That executive didn't have the credentials that were needed to get to the sensitive data. So they had to find another account. They had to move over to another server. They had to migrate across your network. Well, we should have been monitoring that on the network side. We should have been doing more least privilege and segmentation, both on the networking side, but also with those accounts. So we have a number of controls already that are related to this, this attack. And these are where they're failures. These are where you'll find the failures that allowed the adversary to come in. We continue that. They deployed software. Now that's a big red flag to me. You should, no one should be able to deploy software in your organization except IT people that are supposed to. And furthermore, control two says, hey, know what all your software is and only allow your software. So if you already have a list of good software, then this XFIL application couldn't have been put on the system. You would have gotten a red flag there, as well as you would have gotten a detection. Brian just tried to install weird software, but you would have also gotten a prevention that software couldn't run so that exfiltration couldn't run. They might find other ways. You can exfiltrate through a lot of different solutions, so they might still find a way to exfiltrate, but these are areas where in this specific attack, the CIS control should have prevented it or at least detected it. Now, there's some other things we can think about. Now, during this attack, we didn't talk about it specifically, but did they break into the email system and change the routing? It's very common with phishing attacks. The first thing they do is they break into the, the email account and they change some routing and they might utilize that account to send more phishing messages. We should look there. So that brings in our email and web browser detections. Um, we can think about vulnerability management. Were there vulnerabilities? That's our conversation for next month. But vulnerabilities and secure configuration or misconfigurations. Um, were there any uh, data recovery issues? It was mentioned in that paragraph that they did go after backup data. So your backup controls really were related to this. I should have had, had that on the previous slide. But are you encrypting at rest? Are you protecting that backup data, um, et cetera? Or were you protecting it on the network? Malware defense. They probably, that software that they were using for Xville might have been found by malware defense. And other things that they were doing might have been found. That software application control hopefully takes care of it but malware might have been involved. So we should look there. And then ultimately, what service providers are we using? There was a comment that we didn't have all the telemetry from some of the cloud um, providers. So that's where this service provider management control, which is actually a newer control of the CIS controls, comes into play. So you can see that out of 18 controls, I've highlighted at least, what, um, 13 of them? Something like that, right? So most of the controls should have had some kind of component in this breach and should have at least detected it, if not outright uh, prevented it. So these are things we should look into. On the response side, so inside of incident response, these controls are going to help us out as well. Now, we're not talking about incident response directly, but our identity, uh, our identify controls, identify all the assets on your network and only allow those assets to communicate, identify all the software on your network and only allow that software to run, identify where all your data is and only and put controls around your data, um, you know, identify all your accounts, and make sure that those are uh, appropriately used, you know, do you have terminations that never remove the accounts, things like that. And then ultimately, we'll feed that into our training and awareness because uh, we probably need to help people to understand when these attacks happen. At least training those service desk, help desk people um, on getting a better process and understanding when whether the person that you're talking to is really who you think it is. In the protection world, well, we have that app control, least privilege inside of our account management, uh, our account, any kind of account controls that we would have had in place, uh, like multi-factor authentication. Our detection, there's a number of components that are in there. Our response and recover, all of those um, are, are related as well. So you can see that many of our controls are also uh, available, useful in the actual response. And then I put training and awareness in here for each one of these because there's opportunities. We had a failure. What are we going to learn from this and how are we going to get better in the future? All right. So 
general, high level, our CIS controls, they're technical, they assume you have those governance controls, so therefore we better have those conversations. So in addition to the controls themselves, making sure you're doing the technical things, I also want you to talk, look at your organization at the leadership level and ask yourself, how often do you, how often do your information security team communicate with the business? And not just, hey, um, I, I, I'm doing a firewall rule for you and it's completed. No, no, no. Talking about what is the business goal? What does the, how does the business try to accomplish that goal? And then for us to have a thought process of our own so that we can add value to this, what security risks do we see in that process that the business has and how can we help them to protect those, those things at the right levels? So those governance, that leadership conversation, we're going to start talking about, hey, have that steering committee. I already mentioned it. Let's make sure we have that built. And again, if you can't see it in your organization, you should be thinking about building that yourself. Maybe you're not the CISO, so that's not your job. Okay, great. Go to the CISO. Have that conversation. If you are the CISO and you don't have the steering committee, build a steering committee. Start talking to those business units. It's very important. You should already have a charter that says, whoops, this is what uh, information security is designed to do, and here's where we get our authority. Go find that document. See if it's updated. See if it's relevant anymore. See if anybody cares about it. Um, who's the responsible executive that is looking at information security? If you say the CIO, that's probably not the best op option. We want someone that's a little more business aligned. And then Ultimately, what are our guiding principles and maybe that risk appetite from our leadership so that we can build good policy that meets the level that they want? If we're in that traditional, old school, highly regulated organization like that cab company, we're going to have very strong policy and it's going to tie into those regulations and we need to have those connections. However, if we're in that new startup uh, mentality, like I talked about with Uber and Lyft, we're going to accept a lot more risk and we're gonna operate fundamentally differently. We need to understand that and our leadership, our business already knows this. That's where we have to go for this. And ultimately, where other, where, what other requirements do we have? Compliance, regulation, contractual requirements. You know, we're providing a service, Achilles is applying, providing a service to customers a software as a service solution, they have expectations that we're keeping their data um, secure in a certain way. And this breach is suggesting we're missing that. Um, continuing on, I think I've talked about a lot of, oh, sorry, no, this is afterwards, um, after incident. Uh, we should meet with our steering committees, meet with our our responders, meet with our, our actual security teams and identify where there were gaps why there were gaps. This is blameless. We're not talking about Brian screwed everything up because he's dumb. No, Brian screwed everything up because he wasn't trained well. So let's train Brian, right? Um, if, if it truly is Brian is incompetent, well, then maybe there's a hiring process that needs to be fixed or uh, because I can't be trained and we need to do something else let me go. Um, so find those, those issues. We're not trying to find blame. We're trying to find how we solve the problem. So again, if it's a person that did something wrong, how can we get them to do the correct thing? We'll build better guide, guardrails around them or give them training, whatever that is. Um, looking at root cause uh, for each of these, we're looking for ways to improve, we're looking for plans to get to the next level, and ultimately that's that comes down to budgeting and then that training side of things. They also didn't have good focus from security or sort of from leadership. So how do we get to those business units and talk to them? Let's get out there. Let's have those conversations. Let's have them commit or to security being important to them or telling us we don't care about this breach. Breach all of our customers' data, not a problem. That might be the answer. I don't think that's going to be the answer, but it could be. We got to operate inside of that. More likely, they're going to say, never let this happen again. And we say, great. Um, what do you mean by that? You know, and what kinds of what kinds of things are you okay with accepting? Because I can put these controls in place, but they might be too heavy handed. I might be able to put these others; they might be too lightweight. So we got to have those conversations with the organization and get them to understand that how their cyber risk ultimately uh, compares to business risks they're already going through.
there's a lot of business risks already out there. We want to make sure that um, they understand and can compare a business risk to a cyber risk and make the decision of which is more important to uh, resolve in a certain amount of time. Okay, let's see. So uh, one last area I really want to talk about is measurement. So this is where each of us can do a lot. Now we've got to work with those leaders. We've got to build out our program. We've got to have that charter, but coming back to the technical things we can do, we are putting controls in place. EDR, endpoint detection and response, firewalling I mentioned, um, multi-factor authentication. We're putting those controls in place and they're hopefully doing good for you. However, the question is, are they doing anything for you? And if you're not measuring, you can't tell. I've got multi-factor authentication. Does it stop the adversary? I don't know. Does the How often does it, did the adversary get in before? I don't know. How often are they getting in now? I don't know. Is multi-factor even turned on? I don't know. Well, that's crazy. We shouldn't be in that place. We should be able to measure everything that we do. Um, so we put a control in place. Endpoint detection response is installed. We measure how well is endpoint detection response doing? Well, what do we measure there? It can get complicated. And I'll talk about it in a moment, but we need to measure how well we're doing. A simple measurement. We, we implemented endpoint detection and response. Which systems do you implement it on? All systems. Let's just say that word. I know you can't implement it on all systems, but we say all systems. Well, then let's measure. How many systems have endpoint detection response? And we might find that 30% of our organization has endpoint detection response turned on. Is that good or bad? I can't answer that question. Now, 30% sounds really low to me, so I'm probably going to say it's bad, but maybe it's 30% because all of the systems that it can be installed on is 30% of the systems. 70% of the systems are IoT devices. They can't get the agent. Okay, then we're at 100%, even though we're at 30%. So the measurement um, is not the goal. This is just seeing where we are. We have to create a metric for what we want to accomplish. So... We say install endpoint detection response everywhere. We measure, we say it's installed on 30%. And then we say 30% is not enough. We want 95%, whatever that is, right? Uh, we create the metric and that leads to our maturity of our organization. So that's the flow that we want. Now, a lot of times we confuse measurement and metric. So a measurement is a fact. It's just where things are. A metric is a goal. So to give you a flavor of that, I'll stand up. Stand up and be here. So one measurement example, how tall is Brian? Now, we're online. I got a fake background there. You can't see my legs. I, I actually do have legs, by the way. Um, you know, so, so it's going to be hard online. But you can measure me, and I will tell you the measurement for me is six foot or 1.83 meters, depending on where you are and how you measure those things. So that's my measurement. Now, the metric is weird to think about. The metric is, this is the height that we need for something to occur. Well, height, how does that work out? Well, what about going to an amusement park? We go to an amusement park, and you might see a sign that says, you must be taller than this sign to be able to ride on the ride. And I stand next to the sign, and I'm like, yes, I am taller than that. I get to go on the roller coaster, and I have a great day, right? You might have another one that says, you must be smaller than this. And I walk up to it. I'm like, crap, I'm taller. I can't go on that ride. And that's probably for a safety purpose, or I don't, I literally don't fit in the seat. It's made for five-year-olds. And Brian, I am not five years old, just in case you're wondering. The gray hair is a hint uh, that I might not be five. So the metric is something you're trying to achieve. So now let me bring it back to EDR. Endpoint detection response must be on all uh, Windows operating systems. Uh, maybe even Windows and Linux operating systems, something like that, right? And then the measure is, hey, we've got how many of those devices? I don't know. Well, they have to measure that. Okay, so we've got a thousand devices. Great. My metric, oh, sorry, so I have a thousand devices, and out of those thousand devices, maybe 80% of them, 800 of them, have endpoint detection and response. So therefore, my measurement is that I am 80% complete then my metric, I go back to the business and say, is 80% good enough? And they say yes or no. And that leads to our maturity. So that's the idea of this flow. We are able to publish this as well so the business can see how well we're doing in any given moment.
Now, to help us out with that, Center for Internet Security, they have built out a robust measurement and metrics document set that can help us to be uh, do the to figure these out. And they go into extreme detail about every control and all the different things that you can measure so that you can figure out how well that control is working. Some quick examples. We always talk about accuracy and completeness um, inside of the, the course, inside of talking about the controls. And so if we're looking at something here where we're creating control, what do we have? Endpoint inventory. So control number one, uh, what percentage of our endpoint inventory is accounted for in the current enterprise asset inventory? Um, that's actually the same question. Um, oh, this is the aggregate score for each of those. And then the completeness, what percentage of our systems actually have this installed? Um, so or sorry, has the right information. So the first one, how how much of our how many of our systems are in there? That's that percentage. I'm at 80%. Is that good enough? And then the completeness, um, are we getting full details on those systems? You know, I can do a ping sweep and say, hey, we've got 50 um, systems out there, and here's the IP address of each one of them. That's great, but are they Windows machines? Are they servers? Are they workstations? Are they IoT devices? Are they network devices? We don't know. So getting more detail is kind of important as well. So how much of our um, control and how accurate, how detailed is that control? Again, lots of detail on the website. So highly recommend looking through that, building out those. One of the co um, complaints I get uh, when I talk about measurement, especially when we talk about inventory and I say, um, what percentage of your systems are included in your inventory? Uh, people will kick back and say, well, wait a minute, how am I supposed to know the unknown? You know, I, I know that I have 500 devices on the network, but how many devices are supposed to be on the network or how many devices are supposed to be in my inventory? That's an unknown. And so now I can't measure this. Like, great. Figure out the unknown, right? You should be able to know all the things that are interacting with your data, with your network right now. Why shouldn't you know? You own it, right? Put the controls in place. And so as an example, really quickly, on-premise, this only works on-premise, but on-premise, um, any device that has to interact with my network, they got to either plug into my network or go over Wi-Fi. Well, those devices that they connect to are switches. Well, those switches can tell me in a moment what's connected right now. I can find out right now all systems connected to my on-premise network. If I say, well, wait a minute, I'm using cloud services and I'm using BYOD and, and we're all in the we're all working from home. Well, great, you own those services. Who do people connect from? Where do they connect from? What systems are they using to connect from? There's your inventory. So we have this data, we just don't think about it. And that's that list thought process. I, I have a list, must have inventory, have inventory. To a graph, how could the adversary get in? Well, they're gonna get in from any of these devices. So therefore all of those devices need to be in my inventory, even the BYOD devices. Well, how do I get the BYOD devices? Well, it's harder, you know, but I gotta keep track of this stuff. And there's, there's advantages to it. So how can we build out the, these measurements? To help us out at a higher level, so that the previous slide was very low level, measure everything. Um, and those are internal measurements. You're gonna wanna have a lot of those, but you're also gonna wanna report up to the business uh, how well we're doing. And this is one of the tools that's available to you. There's lots of tools available to you. These get into the GRC platforms, the governance, risk, and compliance platforms. Um, this is just an example of one, uh, but we have CSAT and it has the ability to do per control how well we're doing and then give us some aggregate scores. We can publish that. There's a couple different ways that we can do this on um, they're using this software as a service solution or the on-premise version, which does require some kind of licensing. But it's available to us. We can start out with that right now with the cloud-based um, solution and measure how well we're doing. Report that back to management, get better over time. That's the idea of that. Some of the details there, just other additional screens that you're going to be able to see through CSAT itself. I want to get a couple more slides done, and then I'll open up for any kinds of additional questions. There's one last thing I wanted to talk about, um, and then I'll close out. So um, there's a lot of us have more than just 
one thing I need to accomplish. Hey, we chose the CIS controls, so that's all we have to think about. Yeah, that's not true. I also have to, well, I got to meet PCI because of my compliance. And oh, I've got to meet this regulation with the federal government because I'm in that world. Oh, I've got to become ISO certified because that third party will only do business with me if I offer them my ISO certification, et cetera, et cetera. There's, re there's things we have to do in, additional, in addition to just the one thing. Well, I don't want to have two... Password policies, one for CIS and one for PCI. Oh, wait, I need three, one for the regulation. Oh, wait, I need four, one for ICE. No, that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to have one. And then I'm going to make sure it meets all of these standards that you see or the ones that I'm required to meet. So I only want to do it once. Well, how do I guarantee that these things are all uh, aligned with each other? If I create a password policy, it meets both the cybersecurity framework on the screen in the middle there and CIS and maybe that PCI standard. How do I know that? Well, I've got a map between them. And so there is also there are also tools that can help us with that. So really quickly, CIS Navigator, there's the website for it. You can um, put in what kinds of uh, frameworks and compliance and regulations you want to map to. It will help you with those mappings. So you can see that if I do control or safeguard 1.1, I get credit in PCI as well as CIS. And 1.2, but there's also a 1.3. 1.3 does not map into PCI in this example. 1.4, 1.5 doesn't map into PCI. So that's where we see this. You can do the mapping the opposite direction and see that there are things that we may not be handling for PCI, like have a program charter. We're not going to talk about that. PCI will. All right. So that is kind of our idea of how we can leverage our controls to determine where breaches could come from and then shore up those gaps so that we're not going to be the next Achilles out there. Let's learn from these attacks um, and get better. Uh, we do have two more si events coming in this series. So um, if I continue on next month, June 10th, we'll be talking about our vulnerability management. And then in July, we'll, we'll also have, I will come back because this is mine. Uh, we will have a Cyber 42, which is our simulation um, game where we build some scenarios and then we give you some options of how to respond. And then we have a conversation as a group. So this will be one where I want you to all participate in it. And you're going to, you're going to, um, respond to different scenarios, and then we can talk about why you chose that. That's the important part is, why would we go down this path versus that path? That's the kind of thought process that goes on there. All right, I see that uh, we posted those links in the chat. Uh, I don't have anything else that I have to talk about directly, so I have a few more minutes and I'm open to any kind of questions or comments. Uh, so let me know if you have any questions. There's a question and answer available to you. I answered the one question I did see out there. Um, but if there's any others, feel free to post those up and I can answer those. All right. I'm not sure any other questions are coming in, but right. thank you so much, Brian, for your great yeah. presentation to the SANS community and to our audience. We greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org slash webcasts. You can find your CPEs for all completed webcasts by logging into your SANS portal account, navigate to your account dashboard, then click My Webcasts. You can then download your CPE on the right-hand side of the webpage. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast. Thank you all yeah. very much.